Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we come before you asking that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and our minds, that you can give us understanding as we open your word together, as we look at the past history, and as we seek for light uh, for the present. We pray for each person. We know, Lord, that there are many, uh, many trials that each of us is facing, and uh, the enemy is seeking to destroy this work. We just ask, Lord, that we can do the part that you have given us to do, that we can do it faithfully. Thank you for this time of study. May your Holy Spirit teach us as we, we read together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're continuing our study from Notebook 1. And we're not going to read everything. We're just going to go through some of these points that Jeff is bringing out. And here he's going to address the 1260 years and, and the end of it. So 1798. Now, he's going to refer to Daniel 12, verse 7, as, as, as the same period of the 1260 years of papal supremacy. But we know that it isn't, that it's referring to the first half. Um, but that's just a common assumption that people have always made. Uh, and then he's going to give us all the verses that address uh, the period of 1260 years, Revelation 12, 14. Uh, Daniel 7.25, Revelation 12.6, Revelation 11.12, or 11.2, pardon me, uh, and 11.3. And there you have different periods of time, 42 months, uh, 1,203 score days, um, and uh, in Revelation 13.5, again, 42 months, as well as the ones in Daniel that refer to a time, times, and a half a time, or times, times, and dividing of time. So, so we have these different ways in which these are expressed. And of course, at Seventh-day Adventist, we know that they're referring to the same period of time. And they actually established for us that a prophetic year is 360 prophetic days. And that uh, a prophetic month is 30 days. So, um, so those are well-established ideas within Adventism. Now he's going to talk about the characteristic of the papacy here, that um, God's word is going to prophesy or speak clothed in sackcloth, and that's what. What's the reason for the sackcloth? What does it mean? It's clothed in sackcloth. What sackcloth is some? It's a time of mourning. Yeah, it's a type of mourning. So now he, he kind of just talks about these things. The two witnesses of God's word. This is from um, Revelation chapter 11. And, and he says the reason for this sackcloth testimony is because the holy city is being tread under by the papacy. Um, so that means because of the persecution. So the treading down ceases when judgment comes as symbolized by the giving of the court unto the Gentiles. So it, it's something that's well known, um, you know, that period of time and what happens. Now, Ellen White makes some comments. Now, she says 25 years later appeared a next sign mentioned in the prophecy. So 25 years after what is she talking about? The earthquake. Yeah, so the Lisbon earthquake. Um, so, so he doesn't give us that context. He just gives us this quote here. Now, this is going to be about the dark day on the 19th of May, 1780. So, um, so she talks about this, this Lisbon earthquake in the Great Controversy. And then she talks about the dark day. And... Uh, she says, what rendered this more striking was the fact that the time of its fulfillment had been definitely pointed out. 
in the Savior's conversation with his disciples upon all of it, after describing the long period of trial for the church, the 1260 years of papal persecution concerning which he had promised that the tribulation should be shortened, he thus mentioned certain events to precede his coming and fixed the time when the first of these should be witnessed. In those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, Mark 13, 24. The 1260 days or years terminated in 1798, a quarter of a century earlier, persecution had almost wholly ceased. Following this persecution, according to the words of the Christ, the sun was to be darkened on the 19th of May, 1780, this prophecy was fulfilled. Um, now, there were some symbolic representations here that we've noticed about this dark day, is that it happened on um, the 14th day of the second month, that is the second Passover. And what's the significance of the second Passover? It was allowed for people that had been on travel or was in contact with the dead body. Right. So what is the significance for this movement of the second Passover? It connects to the story of the cleansing of the temple in the time of Hezekiah, oh. when there was priests and Levites. And that okay. task, but it, it wasn't done in time, so they had to have the Passover in the second month. Yeah, so it has to do with um, the cleansing that's going on in connection with the priests and Levites. That's in Second Chronicles 29 and 30, correct? I believe. And, yeah. and so we tied that to this movement. Why did we tie it to this movement? I mean, you partly answered it. We're thinking of the difference between priests and Levites. Yeah, okay. So we have the priests and the Levites, and we have the two periods of eight days. And, and Jeff has used that as a symbol. A symbol of what? What's the number? What's, what's that? Yeah, well, it symbolizes resurrection. Yeah. And then we also have a double M. Yes, and it was connected to uh, like a cleansing of the temple. Yeah, so it has to do with the temple cleansing. And now the significance that it's going to be the second Passover rather than the first Passover. We know that in that time, they couldn't get the temple cleansed for the first Passover. So they have the second Passover. There was also a call made at that time to, to northern Israel, right, to participate in this Passover. And this is a couple of years before the siege of Samaria. So they, they make a call to Samaria, to northern Israel, to come to participate. And what does that symbolize for this movement? Well, we connect them to being the Protestants. So this is the, the joining of the two sticks. Right. So it has to do with the joining of the two sticks. So there, there's lots of things about this dark day um, that connects. Now, we also had in uh, 2019, we had the same, the same structure or calendar. Now, when I say it's the 14th day of the second month is the Passover. Uh, technically on the biblical calendar, uh, it's the 13th day of the second month in um, 2019 and in 1780. And on the rabbinic calendar, it's the 14th day of the second month. Now, the way that I've taken it is that um, at the time that the Passover lamb is slain is the evening of the 13th, beginning the 14th, and then the Passover lamb is slain on the 14th. So, so there's some significance there that I haven't really addressed, and I haven't really thought about it too much in detail, other than that in 2019, 
the May 19th date is the same rabbinic and um, biblical date as it is in 1780. And in 2019, I've made some predictions regarding that and connected it with uh, the fall. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that study right now, but there was something about 2019 in the spring that was connected to this. And, and maybe someday I'll figure out more about it. Now, um, Ellen White also makes a statement that uh, he doesn't have here, at least I couldn't see it looking through this. Um, but when she talks about this on page 309 or 308 in the Great Controversy, I'll switch screens here so you can see this. She says, May 19th, 1780 stands in history as the dark day. Since the time of Moses, no period of darkness of equal density, extent and duration has ever been recorded. The description of this event, as given by eyewitnesses, is but an echo of the words of the Lord recorded by the prophet Joel, 2,500 years previous to their fulfillment. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So 2,500 years before 1780 is when? 721 BC. Right. So you're going to have 721 BC. And what's so Joel is writing in what time period? What has just occurred? And, and you can find this when you read through the book of Joel. The uh, captivity of the northern tribes. Right. And so, Assyria. yeah. And in, in 721 BC is the destruction of Samaria. That's the year it's destroyed. So in 723 BC, uh, Hoshea is taken captive. And, and the Bible says it's a three-year siege, but it's, it's really two years if you count it the way we would count it. And, and so in the spring of 721, Samaria is destroyed. So Ellen White is saying that this prophecy is given at the beginning or near the beginning of the 2520 for Israel. And so you can see then she's going to be connecting this. In, in, this is another way sort of to illustrate the 2520. Because if this is 1780, 20 years would bring you to 1800, right? Which is around the time that the 2520 ends. So if she's not being exact, but we can see that she's connecting it to the beginning of that 25, 20 year period. And, and then she's talking about 1798 as being the end of this period. So she's really giving a study on the 25, 20 for Northern Israel, but in an ind indirect way. Does that, that make sense to people? Do I need to illustrate it? Yeah, just uh, go over it again, please. Okay, so what I'll do is I will draw it on the board here. So here you have, back here, you're going to have 723. That's going to be Hoshea, his captivity. And then two years later, you're going to have in 721, uh, Samaria being destroyed. And Ellen White's going to talk about this dark day on May 19th, 1780. And then she's going to say that this is 2,500 years since the prophecy was given, well, 2,500 years would bring us to the destruction of Samaria, if she's being precise. But this is still part of the same history. And then she's going to say, um, you know, she's going to be talking about 1798 in this context. This is all about talking about the time of the end in 1798. 
So one thing you could see here is she's connect, she's giving us a period of 1200 or 25, 2,500 years, but we could see once we put the 18 years here and the two years here, you have the 2520, right? So indirectly, she's talking about this period of time that we would call the 2520 for Northern Israel. But she, and she's connecting it to the 1260, right? <laughs> 508 or 538, pardon me. Um, so you've got the 1260 here, which is she's talking about. But now she's also connecting this 1260 through a period of 2,500 years, which is going to be here. <laughs> so you can see that this is the 2520 that she's talking about. So it, it's an interesting point in how Ellen White is connecting this back to this history through the prophet Joel. Um, now, why she does this in this way, uh, I believe is in God's providence. Um, but I don't think people generally would notice this unless they knew about the 2520 to begin with. A any questions on that? So I, I think that should be pretty clear. So Jeff is going to be taking some of these statements from the Great Controversy dealing with the, uh, the 1260, 1798. Um, this is another statement from the Great Controversy, page 269. According to the words of the prophet then, a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would, ri would rise to make war upon the Bible. In the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, there would be manifest the atheism of the Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. So this is something that we've taught um, quite clearly, and it comes from the spirit of prophecy. And then we're going to see that the power that rises in 1798 is this, um, the lamb-like beast that has two horns like a lamb. So we studied this in connection with the daily. Um, and uh, so she says, the lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented to the prophet as coming up in 1798. Now, this was something that I found interesting um, in that, you know, Americans mark 1776 as the beginning of the United States, and rightly so. But it took time for the nations of the world to recognize the United States as a separate nation. And one of the things that happened in 1790 is the, the United States had their Navy. Um, that's when they first have a Navy and they begin to be recognized as an independent nation by the worlds around them, or, or the, worlds, the countries around them, countries of the world around them. Um, so, and we know about the deadly wound uh, downfall of the papacy in 1798 that marks the end of that period of time. Um, now there's now, thing. yeah okay you have some thoughts. Well, there there is a a point that I'll use with a different thought at later at a later time, but not only was 1798 a time where the United States began to be recognized with its Navy. But July 11th, 1798 is recognized as the foundation of the United States Marine Corps. Okay. Um, so, so you have, there is, it be, starts to become a military power. Correct. Sense, uh, one that, uh, uh, and which is a characteristic of the United States. But what, what really, what, what's also intriguing about that is the United States Continental Marines began on 10th of November of 1775. Okay, so, 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 so what's the difference between the Continental Marines and the Marines? 
the Continental Marines were organized while there was not at that point a, shall we say, a, a recognized government. It was something that we're still at war against Great Britain regarding the taxation. Okay. And then here are the, here's the Marine Corps in 1798, 23 years later, that now United States is, is a developing country and they are now a, a recognized portion of the military. Okay. Yeah, and then in 1798, you're also going to have uh, what they call the quasi war between France and the US. So, so there is some things that occur in 1798 regarding America. So we could probably pick a number of events, but we know that 1798 is marked with the captivity of the Pope on February 15th. So, so, but there is a lot of other things to show that America is rising in 1798. Whether you can mark, you know, exactly in the year 1798, it's rising at that time. Well, as a world power. If we, if we look at this also, the Navy itself began its service as the Continental Navy on the 13th of October of 1775. Yeah. But it was recognized or founded as the United States Navy on the 27th of March of 1794. Okay. Okay. In this type of situation, since we're looking primarily at 1798, mm -hmm. the Marine Corps would be the, the branch of the service, I think, that we would look to most directly as the representation of the budding military might of the country. Yeah, now, you know, I'm not an American and I don't know much about the American military. I do know that the Marines are a special force in the American military. Can, can you explain a little bit about what the Marines are, what their functions? The Marines the Army are- Army and the Navy and the Air Force and State okay. Force. <laughs> Well, okay, the Air Force, of course, didn't exist in 1798. Yeah. The Navy, of course, is going to be more of a, their role is gonna be more of sea control mm -hmm. and deterrence, maritime security, mm -hmm. where when you're dealing with the Marine Corps, you're dealing with more amphibious warfare and they're more of an expeditionary force. Now, the army, of course, is something that's more of a, a group that is, what shall we say, land battle. Yeah. Now, the Marines are the one that went, the ones that went in and killed, um, uh, what's his name? Osama bin Laden. Yeah, and uh, Osama bin Laden. Yeah, and also, um, let me see. Well, who's the one that they went in? They they did a strike. They, I can't remember who all these people are. Um, and they killed him, and then they gave him a burial at sea. Was that Osama bin Laden? That was Osama bin Laden. Okay. Now. <clears throat> Of all the branches of the United States military, yeah, only the United States Army was founded before the United States was recognized as a country. Okay. Because their founding was on June fourteenth of of seventeen seventy five. Okay. So. In this, in this type of situation of the, of the three branches that are recognized from that time period, only the Marines were founded in 1798. Okay, okay. 
Well, thanks for all that information because that, that is helpful. And now, Jeff here is focusing upon this period of, of 1260 years, ending in 1798, and um, giving lots of different statements from the spirit of prophecy. Now, um, I'm just trying to, I'm not, I don't want to read everything because I want to go through quite a bit here. A lot of it is review. Um, Uh, this paragraph here, it says, the Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. And this is an important uh, statement. Now, we, we already re believe in the repeat of Millerite history. Um, but I found it amazing that as this mo movement continued to repeat Millerite history, that, that we repeated it in ways that we we probably didn't want to, especially with July 18th, and people on the wrong side of the issue on July 18th were basically doing exactly what history said they would do. And it's almost like we couldn't act differently than history said we could act. But this should have told us that we were repeating Millerite history. I'm not saying that very well, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, We have to rehearse, that is, we have to go through the same experience that the Millerites had. And why did we have to do that? Ellen White says, every truth that has been given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization, for this would mean apostasy from the truth. Now, um, has this movement uh, strengthened every pillar that God has established? Amen. So there's no doubt about it that if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, if you were to understand the things that God has revealed to this movement, you would become a stronger Adventist in your belief. Now, of course, many people aren't gonna look at it yet, but they will at some point. And of course, this is about the foundation, right? Right now we're examining the foundation. We cannot now step off the foundation. Now, she's gonna say in the next paragraph, she's gonna talk about medical missionary work, she says, needs to be purified and cleansed from everything that would weaken the faith of believers in the past experience of the people of God. So think about this sentence here for a minute. When she talks about this, the medical missionary work needs to be purified and cleansed from everything that would weaken the faith of believers in the past experience of the people of God. Why is she saying this? What was the medical missionary work in her day that needed to be purified and cleansed? What, what was it that it was doing? Who was the head of the medical missionary work at this time? The Kellogg. Kellogg, right? And was he weakening the faith of believers in the past experience of the people of God. Was he part of that? Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. Now, it, it's a very interesting history, um, the history of Kellogg and what was happening. Um, Kellogg and Jones and, uh, you know, Butler and, and all these different people, um, A.G. Daniels, all the there was all these conflicts going on at this time. Uh, one is there was a conflict between the medical missionary work and the ministry. For one, Kellogg was uh, proposing uh, a lifestyle that most of our ministers weren't following. That is, you didn't have many uh, ministers who were vegetarians, for instance. 
um, and of course Kellogg was. Um, but there was also these theo theological issues that were arising. And one of them, of course, was pantheism, which was really popular among some of the ministers, but mostly it was something that um, uh, Kellogg and his friends uh, were, were following. And Ellen White is having to address the fact that both groups of people are have problems. And so when she would write letters to Kellogg, um, you know, basically pointing out his problems, these letters would be used by others as evidence that Kellogg was a problem. But they weren't, they weren't doing what Ellen White was telling them to do in regard to Kellogg because there was just this battleground going on. Nobody was listening to the counsel that applied to them. They were always listening to the counsel that was being applied to others. So um, it, it's a very complicated history of, of what was happening, but here she's addressing this pro problem. Now, we still see this problem, I believe today, in, we saw it in this movement, um, and, and, and in Adventism in general. So this is my perspective. You may disagree with me. But I generally think that the health message in this movement in Adventism has been co-opted by the New Age movement. I grew up. I agree. I grew up with the New Age movement health message. My brother David was a hippie and I read all the books of all the different ways you need to live, the things you need to eat, the, the herbs you needed to take, um, you know, the treatments that you needed to do if you were sick and so forth. And, and Adventism took these things and introduced them to, to conservative Adventism at, and at Adventists are following new age ideas things like colon cleanse and all these types of ideas that people are using. And, and there's tons of them, ideas about toxins and, and how to do treatments and so forth. But if you look at their origins, their origins are not based upon God's word. They're based upon new age ideas. And of course, they're, they're whitewashed a little bit. Now we had some people in this movement like the Dublins um, and and the stuff that they were doing, and other people, I mean, I've seen it over and over again. Some of the, the balanced sort of um, uh, health message work that I saw was, you know, the thrashes uh, in Yuchi Pines, they were good. Silver Hills, where I was, wasn't involved in new age ideas. But most of the health work tends to be. Um, and especially when you have individuals who are now doing medical missionary work, so many of their ideas are, are not based upon uh, the principles that are laid down in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. And, and I, I don't wanna go into details. And I know sometimes you can be stepping on people's toes if you start to go into the details, because there's many things that we believe uh, that, you know, as Seventh-day Adventists about things that we're supposed to eat or not eat, or types of treatments to do and so forth that we just have never questioned. And I think we always need to question these things. We need to say, what's the origin of what I'm doing? Uh, where did this come from? Why do I think that this is, is in accordance with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? And it's not even mentioned in the Bible or spirit of prophecy. And, and I've seen all kinds of things, iridology, uh, reflexology, uh, you know, muscle testing, uh, all these types of things that have no connection whatsoever with the Bible or spirit of prophecy and directly come from new age mysticism. So, so we knew, know that the medical missionary work needed to be purified then, and it needs to be purified now, right? We need to, we need to do the proper health message the way that God had given it to us from the spirit of prophecy and not add to it uh, the strange fire. Now, uh, so when she says there is a need now to rehearse the experience of the man who acted a part in the establishment of our work at the beginning, 
we, we know that one of the things that she is addressing in that history uh, of Kellogg is calling people back to study the first, second, and third angels' messages, that we have to rehearse that experience. So the question is why? Why is it that the first, second, and third angels' message are going to be um, essential in purifying and cleansing the medical missionary work? Because I think that's what she's saying. So why is that? What is the connection? If we don't, if we do not have the experience of the first and second angel's message, yeah. then how can we properly exemplify that which occurs with the third? Okay. Well, that's true. So it's, it's more of an experience that is preparatory to being able to fully understand what the promise of the third angel's message is. Okay, so, so I, well, I would agree with that, but I, I need something that is just what I would call a practical connection. That is, we have medical missionary work. So let's say today we have people who are teaching you know, like the Dublins were teaching, basically, um, no use of medicines of any kind, that if you are sick, it's because you are, are sinning. Um, and they were really teaching a type of purification of the flesh, that basically, righteousness meant you had to have perfect health, right? And, and you see this idea again and again. It's, they, they, they're not unique within Adventism. Um, so... So you have these ideas and you have, you know, connected with that, uh, you know, all these issues uh, about health, you know, there's just so many things going on right now, especially with the pandemic, all kinds of conspiracy theories and so forth. But in order for this to be, this work to be cleansed, because the medical missionary work is extremely important. I I've been involved in the medical missionary work since the mid, um, 1980s. Um, and yet, you know, I've seen it always go off into fanaticism. And now, you know, we have this movement, which I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in, in what this movement had to offer, you know, like 10 years ago. So when, when I came into this movement, I guess in 2010, um, so that's 11 years ago, this was something that had, um, you know, I was focused on righteousness by faith, the third angel's message, and medical missionary work. Um, I wasn't really a person of prophecy as much, even though I'd studied lots of prophecy. Um, I, I looked at prophecy as secondary. But as I got into this movement, I started to realize what I had been missing in studying prophecy. I was interested in chronology and the 2300 days and that, but not really about what's coming, you know. So, so now, we have this movement that is rehearsing the experience of those that gave the first and second and third angels messages. So how does that help in, in just a practical sense? What is it about these messages that corrects the work, that brings everything into line? Just think about your personal experience with this movement, what it has done for you and how it has corrected you. At least I hope that it has, right? Because that's what I believe that this, this movement is about. Okay, so um, see we have, so we got time to go here. So, Think about that question. I, I don't really want to answer it for people. I want people to think about the question. What specifically about this movement corrects the errors 
the, especially those of the spiritualistic and mystical ideas um, that have crept into the medical missionary work. So I'm not, I'm not going to answer it. I want you to think about it. Um, now, in the prophetic time series, we're going to start looking at part six, God's denominated people. Now, um, now it's going to deal with the time of the end itself. So we just dealt with the 1260, and now it's going to deal with the time of the end. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Daniel 12, 13. Um, now, when we think of, about Daniel, um, have we put Daniel on a line? Uh, do we have a line that addresses Daniel himself personally? Is there a time at the end for Daniel? How, how do we look at Daniel? What is his role prophetically? I know I'm asking you to kind of shift gears a little bit on this. One. Yeah, I, I would say he typifies the last generation. Okay, so he's going to typify the last generation. Um, now, if we put him on a line, uh, do, does he have an entire line or does he have just a role or a part in a line? For instance, Ezekiel typifies snow, right? So if we're going to take Ezekiel as a prophet and we're going to place him in Millerite history, we would put Ezekiel as the second angel's message, correct? That's how we'd establish that. Yeah, okay. So would we put Daniel as the first angel's message? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that has to be quite clear that Daniel is the first angel's message. Now, there, there's lots of different connections with Daniel that would, would establish it. One of them, of course, is uh, the time prophecies that are going to lead us to 1798 and, and to that history. Now, of course, He's also going to have the 2300 day prophecy. So he has all these prophecies that are going to then be fulfilled in Miller history. But the specific part is the hour of his judgment is come, right? So when we look at Daniel 8, uh, mostly what we get as 17, as seven day Adventists is this, um, you know, Daniel 8 14, under 2300 2, days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So it's a message about the coming judgment. Now, now Daniel is also in captivity for 70 years. And we mark that captivity. We parallel it with, with 1260. Right? So we can look at Daniel's history as, as the period from the 1260 years. And especially to the end of the 1260. And his focus is upon the end of the 70 years. So if you're going to look at the time at the end, which Jeff is doing here, um, we know that Daniel's going to stand in his lot at the end of the days um, or at the time of the end. So he has to be the first angel's message. Now, of course, the first angel comprises also the second and third. But his, his main focus is the end of this captivity. And Daniel also personally is going to be involved with Cyrus, but he's not going to be involved with Darius's the second decree, Darius the Persian, or with Artaxerxes decree, you know, in a personal way. He's going to be there at the end of the 70 years, and he's going to be there um, directly related to the, the, the decree of Cyrus in Daniel chapter 10. You know, his his prayer is connected to the, the establishment of that decree. So I think it's it's pretty clear. I don't know. Is there any other thing that I'm missing that somebody would try to, to show that Daniel is the first angel's message? Well, Jeff connected it to the, the verse numbers. At the beginning of the book, you have the date being mentioned, the, the introduction being in one verse in Daniel, 
and then two verses in Ezekiel, and then three verses in Jeremiah representing the first, second, and third angel's messages. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and I couldn't remember exactly. Now, what he's talking about is in the book of Daniel, you have, so let's go there. Um, so in the book of Daniel, it's going to introduce um, basically the chronology. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Kim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. So that's one verse. When you go to Ezekiel, one, it's verse one and two, right? So you're going to have 30th year, the fourth day of the fifth, uh, the fifth day of the fourth month, um, in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of Je King Jehoiachin's captivity. So you have the chronology here is introduced in two verses. And then in Jeremiah, it's going to be a little bit longer. That's going to be three verses. And um, so the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were at Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 30th, 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So, so you're going to see these three verses. So, I mean, some people say, well, that's kind of arbitrary. But when you look at the content of these books, Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah, which we're not really addressing Jeremiah now, but we can see that Jeremiah is about the third angel's message. And what, why would we say Jeremiah is about the third angel's message? There, there's something else that, that needs to be considered. Because who is Daniel dealing with? Which king? When he starts off. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, well, yeah, you're thinking of the king of Babylon. But I'm thinking more of the king, Jehoiakim. Right? So Jehoiakim yes. represents the first angel's message. And Jehoiachim represents the second angel's message. And Jeremiah is going to ultimately address Zedekiah, right? Because that's he's going to go all the way from Josiah, 13th year of Josiah, all the way to the reign uh, of Zedekiah, to the carrying away um, of Jerusalem uh, captive, right? So the captivity that's going to happen with Jerusalem. Now, he, so he covers a larger period than in that sense. Um, of, of those kings. Daniel, of course, is a long period of 70 years. But I mean, of those, of that period of Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. So Jeremiah is mostly addressing the issue with Zedekiah, where Ezekiel is focused upon the captivity of Jehoiachin, because he's, he's been taken captive when Jehoiachin was taken. So, I mean, that's a really short summary, but you would see it if you start to go through Jeremiah and look at how Jeremiah um, uh, is laid out and, and the types of prophecies that he, he's given. So, I mean, they all are covering, in a sense, uh, the same period of time, or, or they're, same, they're in the same history. Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah are contemporaries, uh, but there's other things about it as well. Uh, so, so hopefully that that's helpful um, without going into it in too much detail. Now, so when we go back then to the notebook here. Now, this is part six of God's denominated people, but it's part one of the time of the end. So he's talking about God's denominated people here. That's the, the topic of this prophetic time series. So he's got all these sort of subtitles, the prophetic time series. He had a section dealing with the daily, and now he has a section dealing with God's denominated people. Um, he dealt with the 1260 years, and now he's going to have this time of the end section. So I'm not sure why he, he structured it in this way. But we're, we're now in part six 
of the prophetic time series. But, so it's, it's kind of an odd way in which he's, he's divided this though. Um, must have something to do with the way that he did his presentations. Now, Daniel standing his lot at the end of the days. When does Daniel stand in his lot? Seventeen ninety-eight. Okay, so so we can say in seventeen ninety-eight, but we're going to read some things from the Spirit of Prophecy uh, and to try to establish this and what that means. Honored by men with the responsibilities of state and the secrets of kingdoms bearing universal sway, Daniel was honored by God as his ambassador and was given many revelations of the mysteries of ages to come. His wonderful prophecies, as recorded by him in chapter 7 to 12 of the book bearing his name, were not fully understood even by the prophet himself. But before his life labors closed, he was given the blessed assurance that at the end of the days, in the closing periods of this world's history, he would again be permitted to stand in his lot and place. It was not given him to understand all that God had revealed of the divine purpose. Shut up the words and seal the book, he was directed, concerning his prophetic writings. These were to be sealed even to the time of the end. Go thy way, Dan. The angel once more directed the faithful messenger of Jehovah. For the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Go thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Uh, and that's from Prophets and Kings, Kings 547. Daniel has been standing in his lot since the seal was removed. And the light of truth has been shining upon his visions. He stands in his lot bearing the testimony which was to be understood at the end of the days. Um, that's from Sermon and Talks, Volume 1, 225, 226. And then from Testimonies to Ministers, 115. It was the line of the tribe of Judah who unsealed the book and gave to John the revelation of what should be in these last days. So the book that was sealed, um, at least part of that is the book of Daniel, and it's going to be unsealed by the line of the tribe of Judah. Um, but he also gave to John the revelation of what should, should be in these last days. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. These matters are of infinite importance in these last days. For while many shall be purified and made white and tried, the wicked shall be wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. How true this is. Sin is the transgression of the law of God, and those who will not accept the light in regard to the law of God will not understand the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. The book of Daniel is unsealed in the revelation of John to John and carries us forward to the last scenes of this first history. So we know that Daniel stands in his lot in 1790. And how is his book unsealed? And, and what does it mean it's unsealed in the revelation given to John? Because we know it's unsealed in 1798. And John's revelation is given in you know, what, 96 AD. So what does it mean it's unsealed in the revelation given to John? And why is it unsealed in 1798? What's the connection? Because what is what is there in John? Which chapter is she referring to? I think Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. That's where the Millerites uh, self-identified. Okay. Now it's it's interesting. We say that the Millerites self-identified with the first, second, and third angels' messages. Um, I don't think that's true. I think Seventh-day Adventists identify those. Did the Millerites understand the first, second, and third angels' messages? No, not clearly. No. Okay, and somebody else had a comment? Stephen, is that you? Yeah, they didn't really understand the third. 
until after. Yeah, and and it was sort of unfolded to them as they moved through that history. Um, but they weren't really, you know, like when they're giving the first angel's message, hear God and give glory to the, him for the hour of his judgment has come. They're not even really addressing the second and third angel's messages. They don't quite understand where, where, where those messages are placed. Now, I would have said that the book of Daniel is unsealed in Revelation 10. Why would I say that? The eating of the little book. Okay. You're going to see the book of Daniel in the hand of the angel unsealed. It's going to be opened, right, in Revelation 10. So I think that's what Ellen White is referring to when she says the book of Daniel is unsealed in the Revelation of John. I don't think that she's she's talking in sort of this general sense. I think she's talking about Revelation 10 specifically. Now, in Revelation 10, we now have Millerite history being shown to us. But it's going to be sealed. Right? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, this to me is extremely important. It's, um, and Ellen White writes about this, of course, and, and we've read her statements regarding Revelation chapter 10, uh, dealing with the seven thunders. So, and, and I wrote a paper on this, what, what I understand from what she said about the seven thunders. So you're gonna have in Revelation 10 too, this might, another mighty angel come down from heaven. And he has in his hand a little book opened. So when does this mighty angel come down from heaven with this book, little book opened? Where, where specifically where we would we place this? We've connected it to 11th of August, 1840. Right, so it's August 11th, 1840. And that's the empowerment of the first angel's message. So... So even though we say that Dan, the book of Daniel is opened in 1798, it is, but it's it, that message of the first angel's message is empowered with the events of August 11th, 1840. And, and we can see, of course, Revelation 9 precedes Revelation 10, right? And Revelation 9 is going to deal with the prophecy of, um, you know, the end of the second woe. So... You know, the one thing is I had studied Revelation through and through and through before I came into this movement. And there's no way that I could have understood um, what is really in Revelation without understanding Millerite history, which I didn't understand. So I'd see these sketchy ideas uh, about this. And we can see that this, this becomes extremely powerful as we place uh, Revelation 10 correctly that this is august 11th 1840 and most seventh day adventists would not do that they might say 1798 but this is august 11th 1840 because that's when the mighty angel comes down from heaven and, and the same thing is going to happen at 9 11 right we're going to say see the same thing a mighty angel is going to come down at 9 11. okay so and now we're going to have these seven thunders. So these seven thunders are going to be the description of Millerite history. But then these seven thunders are going to be sealed up. So John's going to see Millerite history. But he's, he's going to be told to seal up what he heard. And, and the unsealing of these seven thunders is this movement. Now, some people might have thought, you know, if, well, if this was Millerite history and it was sealed up with these seven thunders, that it's unsealed after October 22nd, 1844, as they come to understand their disappointment, because that's primarily what's being described here, is about the disappointment that has to be sealed up. But we know that this movement has unsealed Millerite history by the events that we have passed through, the rehearsal of Millerite history, the rehearsal of the first and second angel's message and the, and the third angel's message that this movement has experienced has what is what um, 
that it it's what that is unsealed, the seven thunders. So we know that there's the eating of the little book, all of these things. We can connect this to other places in scripture, Ezekiel and so forth, um, that has to do with this movement. And so I don't, I don't want to go into this in too much detail right now, but it's, it's an important point. And, and hopefully people understand this point about Daniel standing in his law. That it's, it's, there's this part in Millerite history, but he continues to stand in his law and bear his testimony. So does Daniel stand in his law in our time? Yes, in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Yes, yeah. So we can say Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And, and the understanding of Daniel 12. So Daniel 12 also relates to our history. because And we also have the time at the end in our time. So Daniel stands in his lot in Millerite history. And he stands in his lot in our history. Uh, when God gives man a special work to do, he is to stand in his lot and place, as did Daniel, ready to answer the call, ready to fulfill his purpose. So are we to stand in our lot? Do we have a special work that God has given us to do? We do, yes. Yeah, it, it, it's a huge responsibility. Um, now, some people think they would want that responsibility, but you don't because it, it's a grave responsibility. And, and to stand in our lot, to be faithful in this work is very, very difficult. Um, every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened. When Daniel, when with Daniel, every individual must stand in his lot at the end of the days. Now, this idea of standing in your lot, Ellen White is also attaching it to what? To what event? The end of the days. Okay, to the judgment, right? So we are sitting in judgment. The judgment has, has, been, has been set and the books have been opened. And part of this standing in your lot is to be judged. W would you agree with that? Yep. Now, when Daniel stands in his lot, one of the symbols there has to do with the special resurrection. Um, so Daniel is going to be part of the special resurrection. And he's going to stand in his lot. So Daniel's going to be there to see Christ return, along with all who died under the proclamation of the third angel's message, as well as people who were there at the time that Christ was crucified and so forth. So certain people from history are going to be there standing. But the ones who stand in their lot are the ones who are going to, come to, to be judged uh, in this investigative judgment. Now, I want you to think about this idea, because when we think about the investigative judgment, is, is it something that's a passive or an active? I can't think really of a better way to describe it, but are we just waiting there to be judged? What, what's happening? Uh, no, it's based on our current uh, life every day. No. Okay. Yeah. So, is still open. yeah. So if we look at this, this next part that Ellen White talks about, and we think about the judgment that she's talking about and standing in our lot, she's going to deal with the, the seven thunders, right? So this is the part of, um, this is from seven Bible commentary and where she explains the seven thunders. And I did a paper on this 
this passage. Okay, after these, after these seven thunders utter their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. So just as Daniel was told to seal up his book, John is now going to be told to seal up the seven thunders. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. So Ellen White's connecting the sealing up of the book of Daniel with the sealing up of the seven thunders. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. And so these are future events. Now, some people read this as this is just talking about future events to John. But Ellen White is really saying that these are future events to her from the time that she's writing this. So that there are things, and that she doesn't say they are the future events, these relate to future events. So the seven thunders refer to Millerite history, and these are gonna rate, relate to future events, which is our history. And when, what does it mean disclosed? Because we don't really use that word in the sense that she's talking about. Like open up? Opened up, right? Okay, so these are being opened up. That is, these, these, what the seven thunders uttered, those things have been sealed up, and they're going to be unsealed in their order. Right? So we know that that's going to happen in our history. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. So she's putting that, I think, future. John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be given to the world. So she's talking about, in some ways, she's talking about, of course, when they were first given, but she's also talking about their repeat of history. And then she says the unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. So what does she mean by that? She's alluding to August 11th, 1840. Okay, August 11th, 1840, so good. Because this was a message in relation to time. That was the unsealing of the little book. Now we can also say that the 1260 is connected to that as well. But we see the book of, of Daniel unsealed in Revelation 10. And that unsealing had come through the events that are in Revelation 9. It was a time message. And so the establishment of the year-day principle based upon Josiah Rich's prophecy and its fulfillment is extremely important. So we know that time is involved. Now, one of the things we did in our movement is we recognized that we were repeating Millerite history and that time was already part of this movement. Um, now, in doing that, we made a leap that we could predict events in our history. And we found that we couldn't predict the events. We could predict the time, but we have to wait until the time had passed to really understand the events. And so we were doing a type of time setting, just as the Millerites were. And just as the Millerites did, we were, we were wrong in what we were doing. That is, the Millerites could not predict the second coming of Christ. They should have known that from God's word. And we had the same sort of counsel from God's word. that We weren't supposed to time set. And yet we did under God's providence, just as the Millerites did under God's providence. And, and this, but this was important for us to repeat Millerite history and to give a testimony that God was leading this movement. The books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. One a book sealed, the other a book opened. John heard the mysteries which the, set, the thunders uttered, but he was commanded not to write them. Okay, so... So John is going to hear the, the disappointment of the Millerites. He's going to hear 
what's going to happen to God's people from 1798 to 1844. But he, he seals this up. Now, then she says, and I think that we've often misread this. She says, the special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's message. So there was a special light given to John. It was expressed in the seven thunders. And, and that special light was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's message. Now, does it say the seven thunders are a de delineation of events? Or that the special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven letters, was a delineation of events. And I don't, maybe, maybe people don't understand the distinction. But one of the things that we were teaching in this movement is that we were to take the seven thunders and mark seven events in Millerite history that we would call the seven thunders. Is that correct? That's what we did, but we found out there was more than seven uh, notable Millerite events. So picking which of the seven thunders which went with which event was kind of problematic. Right. So we kept moving these around, and and that was kind of a problem because we we tried to figure out well, what are these seven thunders? What are the seven events that we're going to choose? And of course. Um, and they, and they kept moving even, even where we placed, for instance, the arrival of the second angel's message, it changed as well. And, and we didn't even have some of the waymarks. So if you look at early on, we have these seven thunders, um, quite different events than we had later as we started to understand this. But we still kept the symbol of the seven thunders as seven events. Um, so the seven thunders, I believe are actually what are occurring in our history. That is, in our history, we have the events of Millerite history being opened up as we pass through Millerite history. So it, it's something that we need to look at in more detail. But we can see here that in 1999, that Jeff is is understanding some of these things, but some of these things aren't fully understood. But he's giving us all of the, the spirit of prophecy quotes and the scriptures and putting them in their correct place. It's just there's no way that he could see what he's saying, especially prior to 9-11. So the first and second angels' messages, um, Okay, uh, we transpire. Okay, transpire under the first and second angel's message. What does the word transpire mean? Occur, that they would happen. Okay, that's how we use it. What does the word mean? I'm not up on the etymology. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so this is just one of those words, which again, has sort of changed meaning over time. Um, um, I'm just gonna look it up in Webster's here quickly. And always when I open up Webster's on ESOR, it takes forever. Anybody wanna take a shot at it, what they think transpiring means, or maybe you already looked it up. From the Latin, it sounds like cross breathing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, because uh, fire, fire. What's well, that? Breathe, uh, spiral or whatever. Okay, well, my ESO is locked up. Um, so, because she doesn't just mean occur, the events that would occur, because um, you know, that's kind of how we we deal with it. I, I need to look up the word, though. Um, so we can see the word uh, spire, which has to do with breathing, right? Like the word inspiration or perspiration, spirit. 
Uh, tran means what? Across. Right. That, so the idea here, um, I'm just going to, because I know there's, I looked this up before. Um, Ah, here's what it means. Um, to escape secret from secrecy. So this is what Webster says. To escape from secrecy to become public. The proceedings of the council have not yet transpired. So we don't use the word in this way anymore. Right? We use it in the, in the secondary meaning to happen or to come to pass. But I believe in the context here, would this mean they were to transpire under the first and second angel's message? Means to escape from secrecy or to become public. Would that make more sense? Because we know that these were sealed up, right? So the special light given to John was a delineation of events which would be made public under the first and second angel's message. Or to be um, um, escaped from secrecy. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yes, I do, definitely. And it makes perfect sense. Okay. So when she says, which would transpire, when, are, when is the Millerite history going to escape from secrecy? Did it escape from secrecy during the first and second angel's messages in Millerite history? Or is it going to escape from secrecy in the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages in our history? That's an interesting way to express it. Yeah. So I think the fact that you use this transpire, I mean, we can say in Millerite history that the first and second angel's messages in some ways are made public. But she says it was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested in Millerite history. In the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. Now, we know in Millerite history, they did a work, and we now had um, new light, which had to do with the sanctuary in Christ's ministry, uh, investigative judgment, the Sabbath as well. All of these things became understood um, in what happened in Millerite history. And so the same thing happens in our history. This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with a most solemn oath that time should be no longer. So we know that there's this connection between Revelation 10 and Daniel chapter 12, because you have this, um, the, this oath being made by Christ. Um, that the time should be no longer. This time, which the angel declares with the solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither a probationary time, but a prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reckoning from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. So we take this passage here from the spirit of prophecy. And what do we say as Seventh-day Adventists? This, this paragraph. Well, the church teaches us the end of the 2300 days. Okay, so it's the end of the 2300 days. But we just say we're never going to have any message, any kind of time after October 22nd, 1844. Any sort of reference to time is immaterial, right? 
and, and people in this movement have even rejected 1863 as the end of the prophetic mirror based upon the time that no time exists beyond October 22nd, 1844. They reject the 126 years um, from 1863 to 1989, etc. cetera, right? Because they said we were wrong to use time at all. Because they take this statement after July 18th, people looked at this and said, well, we were wrong. We shouldn't have had had any reference to time. You know, what happened in, in 1863, that's not connected to time. You know, that's just, if we find that, you know, there's the prophetic mirror that ends in 1863, um, that's, that's time saving, right? So people took that position in this movement. But we know that time was a part of this movement. So what does she mean that we're not going to have another message upon definite time? Is this relating to um, time prophecies revealed in the Bible? Okay. Well, yeah. So we have the 2300 days. We have the 1335, we have the 2520. Those all end in 1844. Of course, the 1335 in the spring, the 2520 the 2300 days in the fall. Um, but these are messages dealing with, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, we, did, we never made a prediction regarding the second coming. And actually, she's quite clear. We, we can't know when probation would close. We can't know when the loud cry is going to be poured out. Um, we can't know uh, when Jesus is going to return. We can't have a message based upon time in those contexts. Now, but we do have time in our message within this movement. Now, if we look at the third angel's message from October 22nd, 1844, the third angel's message arrives. We're going to have 1989 that's going to show up. And again, it's going to be the time of the end. But in that history from 1989, which marks the beginning of this movement, it's now a repeat of Millerite history. But as far as Millerite history is concerned, October 22nd, 1844 is the arrival of the third angel's message. And there's no time connected with the third angel's message. Ellen White says that the third angel's message does not hang upon time. But do the first and second angel's messages hang upon time? Kind of stuck there on that idea. Okay. Um, anybody know where the statement is about time? Third angel's message does not need time. Is that the Review and Herald of 1851? Okay, so Review and Herald? The 21st of July, 1851. Okay, so that's that's the, the passage there that we had that's in early writings, right? That's, that's what you're saying? Yes, yes. So, so we had this message, and it's it's a vision that was on June 21st, 1851, and it's going to be published on July 21st, 1851. 
seven years to the day from when the midnight cry is given in Boston. Correct? Yes. So, okay. So, um, and I'm just gonna, we're gonna look at this statement again here, I just have to open it up. Um, yeah, so this is, um, can't remember what it's called. I think it's manuscript one, 1851, yeah, okay. Okay, <clears throat> uh, the Lord showed me that the message must go and that it must never be hung on time. For time will, will, will never, for time never will be a test again. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from the preaching time, that the third angel's message can stand on its own foundation and that it needs not time to strengthen it and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. So in this context, Ellen White is talking about the third angel's message. So the question is, do the first and second angel's messages need time? Do they need time to strengthen them? Well, the first time they came, they did. Yeah, and, and I would say the second time they come, they do as well. Because we've had time being a witness to the first and second angel's message in this movement, correct? And without that time, we would just have a subjective idea uh, regarding the repeat of history. That is, we would have no way to tie what we're doing to that repeat of history. We've used time to do this right from the very beginning in this movement, we saw time. And we can place our way marks based upon time, but it's the repeat of the first and second angels messages that now have time attached to them. Now, when Ellen Weiss writing in 1851, and she's talking about the third angel's message, which does, it's not to be hung on time. We can see that that's always true. Does the third angel's message need time? Does it need time to strengthen it? Are we gonna connect time to the third angel's message? We cannot connect time to the third angel's message. But we can't, right? But we can connect it to the first and second angel's message. Right. So when time is no longer, on October 22nd, 1844, the third angel's message has, has arrived. And there is no other time that can be attached after October 22nd, 1844 to the third angel's message. But in the repeat of history, we experienced time. And that, that's not time for the third angel's message. It's not time for the second coming of Christ. It's not, we weren't marking the close of probation on the big line, right? When Dan, when, when Michael stands up, you know, Daniel chapter 12, verse one, that has not been marked by this movement and it can't be. So we just have the first and second angels messages, which this movement is repeating Millerite history, we're repeating the first and second angels message. It's the parable of the 10 virgins, which is the first and second angels message. We're repeating that to the very letter. So then it says, uh, the angel's position with one foot on the sea and the other on the land signifies the wide extent of the proclamation of the message. It will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other countries, even to all the world. The comprehension of truth, the glad reception of the message is represented in the eating of the little book. The truth in regard to the time of the advent of our Lord was a precious message to our souls. Now, and, and when you think about that sentence, the truth in regard to the time of the advent of our Lord, 
did Christ come back October 22nd, 1844? No. But was it a proclamation or was it a truth in regard to the time of the advent of our Lord? Was it, even though Christ didn't come back, is it connected to the second coming? Most yes. definitely. Yes, it is, right? So we know October 22nd, 1844 marks the beginning of the Day of Atonement. When probation closes, part of that Day of Atonement, which we've been going through, and we're going to study this when we get deeper into the sanctuary messages, because um, we're going to look in detail of where we are in the Day of Atonement. But we know that the sins will be confessed upon the head of the scapegoat when probation closes. And that hasn't come yet. But we are in the Day of Atonement. In a sense, the, la the Day of Atonement is a period of time that's going to go from October 22nd, 1844 to the Second Coming. It's the third angel's message is in regard to the Day of Atonement. Would we, would we agree with that? Yes. Yeah. So that day began October 22nd, 1844, and we're still in that day. So if we're in the same day, do we have time? I mean, maybe we could say we have hours and minutes and seconds and so forth. But, but we're just in the day, right? Now, as far as this movement is concerned, we have to repeat the first and second angel's messages in order that, the, that we can prepare Adventists for the test, which is the Sunday law. And so time was attached to this movement. Now, there are people who are seeking to set dates and mark events that they believe that we still can time set. And what would we say to them? Right? Exactly what would they say that we could time set about? Okay, so we can always time set in relationship to the first and second angel's message, right? Correct. So, so we know we can do that. Now, if you remember back in 2018, when we had started time setting, I made the case that our time setting was limited. Now, um, that is, I didn't believe that we could predict the close of probation for the world. Um, and, and there was discussion, discussion regarding that into 2019. Where, where does time setting set its limits. Now, when I was at um, the School of the Prophets in 2018, uh, a brother from Romania presented this idea of, of patterns and that we could even predict the second coming of Christ. Now, after he had done this presentation, I went up to him and talked to him and, and I said, we can't. And he wasn't really happy with that, but I explained why we can't. We can't set dates for the second coming of Christ. It's very clear that the date for the second coming of Christ is going to be announced by God after the special resurrection. And we're not going to know when that date is. Of that day and hour, knoweth no man. Right? Uh, and that's still always true until it's proclaimed by the voice of God. And he said, well, maybe the voice of God is this movement What error is, was he making? That man's voice is God's voice. Right. This movement, we, we aren't the voice of God. It's pretty clear. I mean, uh, but yet people will get around it. They will, I, I call it spiritualizing God's word. That is, God's word has symbols, but those symbols are always connected and explained clearly in the scriptures but when people do this type of of twisting of the word of god i mean 
you're going to spiritualize away even what the special resurrection is in order to do that. Um, so we're not going to be using our calendars and Bible chronology to predict when Jesus is going to come back. Now, we might, after the fact, you know, be amazed at what we see as part of that structure, that it might have been connected. But there's no way that we're going to be doing that, that we're going to say, well, Jesus is going to come in 20, 2030 based upon, you know, you know, the week of Christ or something like that, which we could do. We could think 2030, the first day, the first month, say that's when Jesus is coming back. But Ellen White says people will be setting dates farther in the future um, than Christ is actually going to return. And so man's always going to do that. So I think we have to be extremely careful as we look at this issue of time setting. He's going to go into this in more detail. Um, so uh, we're just, uh, we went a little bit over time. But I'm just going to read this part here, this, uh, these two paragraphs. Um, Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 2019 and 2020. Can I say that? We would like to, but we don't want to admit there's we were a disappointment in a disappointment. Well, I, we saw a disappointment. Well, I I do. I mean, I'm I'm thankful that we were in a disappointment. The message was given, and there should be no delay in repeating the message, for the signs of the times are fulfilling. The closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. So once again, Daniel is going to do that. The attention of our churches must be aroused. We are standing upon the borders of the greatest event in the world's history. And Satan must not have the power over the people of God, causing them to sleep on. The papacy will appear in its power. All must now arouse and search the scriptures, for God will make known to his faithful ones what shall be in the last time. The word of the Lord is to come to his people in power. This is way more true now than it was when it was written. This is the point of where we are at. And that's why we're studying this foundation. Because we need to be anchored in the past if we're going to proclaim a message in the future. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for this study, uh, for the precious time that we have together. We pray, Lord, for each person watching this study, that you can work upon our hearts, that you can break us and mold us that uh, we can see our need of you, that we can admit our errors, that we can be corrected by your spirit. And Lord, we pray for this movement, that you can use it uh, to your glory. Thank you for hearing our prayer and bring us together again to study your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.